Well, good morning and greetings from Malibu, California and Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. I'm just off camera here, Pete Peterson, uh, the Dean of this Graduate Policy School, and I'd like to welcome you all to the first of a series of short courses that we'll be hosting here directly from our Malibu campus on Fridays throughout the month of April. Our first class this morning is with Dr. Bill McClay, our Ronald Reagan Professor of Public Policy, and it's entitled Land of Hope, an Invitation into the Great American Story. And so this will be a, a course on American history based on uh, Bill's best-selling textbook, Land of Hope. Before we get started, I wanted to provide just a couple logistics notes. For some of you, this may be your first time utilizing the Zoom platform. And so uh, we'd ask you all to uh, mute your microphones. Uh, you have a, a microphone icon you should in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And if you just click on that, so the uh, dash across the microphone, noting that the microphone is muted, that would be very helpful. Uh, we'll be going live to the video here in a second. Uh, the format for each of these classes is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, there'll be lecture style, uh, about 45 minutes or so of this hour long session will be uh, Bill leading in a lecture on the subject, uh, but we will be reserving the last 15 minutes for, for your questions and answers. Now we have a very large group who has registered here and from all over the world. And so we're very excited to welcome you here to Malibu for uh, this morning's session. The way that you can interact with us uh, throughout the session is through the chat box, which you should see also in the lower section of your screen. Uh, there should be a, a small icon that says chat. And so if you click on that and would like to type a question for Dr. McClay, when we hit the last 15 minutes of the session, uh, I'll begin to moderate those questions and answers. So again, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Again, this first uh, session is with uh, Dr. Bill McClay. Uh, Dr. McClay is with us this year as our Ronald Reagan Professor of Public Policy. Uh, he is a uh, full-time and tenured faculty, the GT and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma, where he also directs their Center for the History of Liberty. His book, The Masterless Self and Society of Modern America, was awarded the Merle Curdy Award of, organization, of the Organization of American Historians for the best book in American intellectual history. Uh, Bill has written a number of books on American history and the role of faith in uh, American history and politics. But this particular class, again, is based on Bill's current and new uh, best-selling history textbook, which uh, we'll be discussing several times throughout the course of this next month, Land of Hope, an Invitation into the Great American Story. So again, if you will, uh, if you're just joining, if you will mute your microphones in the lower left-hand corner. Again, I invite uh, your interaction with uh, the session here through the chat box, which I will be uh, moderating. And after the first 45 minutes, we'll go directly into Q&A for the last 15 minutes. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. McClay. Welcome him to the session. Welcome, Dr. McClay. Thank you, Pete. It's great to be here. And uh, I, I'm kind of overwhelmed at the thought that I'm speaking to uh, people all over the world, uh, as well as uh, people just around California. I want to thank all of you for your willingness to sacrifice uh, all your activities for the day. You're surfing, uh, beachcombing, uh, uh, breakfasts with friends at swanky <laughs> restaurants, uh, all the all the things you would be doing, or perhaps cleaning your house <laughs> for the umpteenth time. Uh, it's uh, it 
it actually is a, is a great bonding experience in a certain way, this, this confinement to quarters that we're all going through, um, hopefully for not too much longer. But uh, uh, I wanted to begin, I wanted to take the liberty of beginning uh, by talking a little bit about this uh, coronavirus thing, and, but not directly. Uh, what I'm what I'm interested in is uh, the fact that uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I've been I was working on an essay uh, for a, a periodical. I won't say which one, but uh, and someone uh, uh, said to me, "Well, how can you write about this subject without bringing in the coronavirus?" And uh, and it sort of dovetails with my sense that the whole journalistic and intellectual world is utterly consumed with. Uh, recasting all of human life, all of human history, all of the future uh, in terms of the coronavirus. What will be the effect of the coronavirus on higher education, on dating, on food, <laughs> on uh, uh, dining, uh, you name it, on cruises and vacations and travel and uh, so on. Um, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we could guess there might be some effects. There might not be any enduring effects. We don't really know, but uh, it is, is the nature of our minds and the way we think these days to have a very, very short uh, time span in mind, uh, to have uh, a lack of a sense of the, of the, uh, <clears throat> the enduring uh, sort of inertia of human life uh, and of human history. And, uh, in short, I, th I think we think that when we're living through a crisis, and this is a crisis, I don't mean to minimize it at all in that sense, but that we're experiencing something that has no precedent in human history and that after which uh, everything will be changed. Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, who I think is often a, a, a juicy target for rationality, uh, it has written a column in which he says, in the future, we will all speak of BC and AC, uh, what about DC, but uh, before and after the coronavirus. So it'd be the epical sort of uh, caesura of human history. Uh, well, this is ridiculous. I, I, I think I can say that even without knowing how all this is going to come out. Um, it's ridiculous to do it at this point in time when so much is unknown. Um, and the real task at hand is dealing with the problem, not reflecting on some kind of historic repercussions from it. So uh, uh, I, I wanted to share with you, and this is the liberty I'm taking, um, several quotations, <clears throat> uh, two from C.S. Lewis, the great uh, uh, scholar and theologian, uh, and then one is taken from my book, Land of Hope. Uh, and, let me read, we, we, we tried to have all these up on PowerPoint, but one of them is missing at the last moment. It flew to Coop, so uh, let me read you. This is from an essay that Lewis wrote uh, in uh, 1939, in the fall of 1939, not long after the beginning of, uh, of hostilities in the, in the Second World War in Europe. And uh, <clears throat> he was giving a talk to uh, students um, at Oxford about uh, the whole question of w why should one um, take time out to study uh, in, the, in the midst of such a great a emergency. Um, of course, in 1939, people didn't know how bad it was going to get in October, I believe it was in 1939. But still, uh, the, the, the issue of this, what became the, the essay called Learning in Wartime, is pertinent and mm. uh, and uh, pretty much uh, in, in, in enduring. Mm. Uh, uh, so let me let me just I'm just going to read some passages from that. Two passages. First, this one, and then when we get to the second one, we'll be able to show it to you on a PowerPoint. Lewis says, "I think it is important to try to see the present calamity in um. no absolutely new situation." Now he's talking about the war. Uh, you might substitute uh, the uh, the virus, uh, at, at which the president has asked us to think of as uh, as, a, as an opponent in war. Uh, the war creates absolutely no 
excuse me, the war creates no absolutely new situation. It simply aggravates the permanent human situation so that we can no longer ignore it. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. Human culture has always had to exist under the shadow of something infinitely more important than itself. If men had postponed the search for knowledge and beauty until they were secure, the search would never have begun. Mm -hmm. We are mistaken when we compare war with, quote, normal life. Life has never been normal. Think about that. Life has never been normal. Even those periods which we think most tranquil, like the 19th century, turn out on closer inspection to be full of cries, alarms, difficulties, emergencies, and I would add bloodshed. Plausible reasons have never been lacking for putting off nearly all cultural activities until some imminent danger has been averted or some crying injustice put right. But humanity long ago chose to neglect those plausible reasons, which I take it you are also doing in tuning into this mm -hmm. and to taking time out from this instead of running out into the streets and trying to be useful. They wanted knowledge and beauty now and would not wait for the suitable moment that would never come. Periclean Athens leaves us not only the Parthenon, but significantly the funeral oration. The insects have chosen a different line. They have sought first the material welfare and security of the hive, and they presumably have their reward. Men are different, and I think we could say that's generic men, including women. They propound mathematical theorems in beleaguered cities, conduct metaphysical arguments in condemned cells, conduct, uh, make jokes on the scaffold, discuss the latest new poem while advancing the walls of Quebec, and they comb their hair at Thermopylae. This is not pan panache, this is our nature. So the pursuit of higher things, of longer horizons, of more permanent perspectives is simply what we do uh, as human beings. We seek that transcendent uh, that, is, that rises above circumstances, even dire circumstances, uh, in order to take uh, the longer view, longer than the insects at any rate. And, um, and we should try to do that now, it seems to me. Okay, and, and, and now we're ready for a second um, Lewis quote. Uh, which is more pertinent to history. Yeah, you want to get that guy off of there. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, this is more pertinent specifically to history toward the end of the essay. And, and by the way, I don't know whether Melissa was able to do this. I wanted to make this essay available to everybody by a PDF file if, if we can. So I'm sure we can. Uh, I think we can do that um, it, because it's, it's a, just a smashing, scintillatingly good essay that it repays rereading many, many times. I think a lot of people discovered this essay during 9-11 and the aftermath of 9-11, when uh, it really seemed that the world had been changed forever in a co comprehensive way. Okay, second quote from later on in Lewis's wonderful essay, uh, Learning in Wartime. Most of all, perhaps we need intimate knowledge of the past. He's clearly just been listing things we need to gain some leverage on the uh, over against the flow of events that threatens to engulf us. Not that the past has any magic about it, but because we cannot study the future and yet need something to set against the present to remind us that periods and that much of which it seems certain to the uneducated is merely temporary fashion. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be deceived by the local errors, errors of his native village. The scholar who has lived many times and is therefore in some degree immune from the great cataract of nonsense that pours from the press and the microphone of his own age. 
I, I, <laughs> I think that last part is certainly something we all can relate to at the moment. We, we've been engulfed by and we have an appetite for this endless uh, flood, the great cataract of nonsense, um, you know, Thomas Friedman et al. Uh, and, and are looking for something more stable, more, more grounded in, in verity, in truth, in something that endures. So um, again, th th that's Lewis's advice to us uh, regarding learning in war time. This is not the time to say, oh, you know, I can't study philosophy. How frivolous. I can't study principles of public policy, sort of retool myself to, to think afresh about public affairs. That's a luxury that I can't afford, that we can't afford. Um, Self-indulgence. No, that's simply the wrong way to look at it. And then finally, uh, let me give you one last quotation to propel you into the rest of my uh, topic for today. It's, it's taken from the, my book, which Pete has mentioned, but which I, I brought a copy just in case you wow. wanted to see what it looks like. A Land of Hope, uh, an invitation to the great American story. Cool. And I'll talk, talk more. That's really what my topic is today, to tell you about the book, why I wrote it. Yeah, it's better you, right? Then I hope we can have a lively discussion of that. But one thing I did that was unusual in the book was I have a very long epigraph. You know, and the epigraph is the quotation that comes before the beginning of the book. And usually it's a short, pithy, um, epigrammatic statement, some saying of Mark Twain or something like that. Um, this one is a little essay. <laughs> it's two paragraphs long. Uh, and Pete is uh, just uh, yeah. holding it up on the, on the PowerPoint. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is taken from an essay by John Dos Passos, uh, a name that many of you well yeah. know, the younger people. Yeah. Probably the older people don't know me either, but he was a great American novelist, uh, really at his prime about a hundred years ago. Um, great innovator, um, sort of in a class with Faulkner and James Joyce and, and others who were uh, innovating a, a formal uh, pattern of literature and, uh, and very politically radical, very radical. Um, uh, and uh, Dos Passos uh, over time underwent a, a sea change and became a man of what I guess we would call now the center right um, and, um, and began to get interested in American history, a subject for which he had formerly had uh, nothing but disdain. You know, it was just a procession of horrors uh, so far as he was concerned. And that was what his ideological perspective demanded. And um, so Passos wrote uh, the uh, essays about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, there's a wonderful essay about Jefferson's Monticello called Portico in the Wilderness that I recommend to you. Anyway, um, uh, those Passos, uh, wrote this essay called The Use of the Past, from which I'm quoted. And I'll read it to you, but you can see it as I write, uh, as I read it. Every generation rewrites the past. This is an important statement we'll come back to. In easy times, history is more or less of an ornamental art. But in, in times of danger, we're driven to the written record by a pressing need to find answers to the riddles of today. We need to know what kind of firm ground other men belonging to generations before us have found to stand on. In spite of changing conditions of life, they were not very different from ourselves. Their thoughts were the grandfathers of our thoughts. They managed to meet situations as difficult as those we have to face, to meet them sometimes lightheartedly and in some measure to make their hopes prevail. We need to know how they did it. In, yeah, in times of change. In times of change and danger, when there's a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, can you relate to that? <laughs> a sense of continuity with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present and get us past that idiot delusion 
of the exceptional now that blocks good thinking. That is why in times like ours, when old institutions are caving in and being replaced by new institutions, not necessarily in accord with Bozeman's preconceived hopes, political thought has to look backwards as well as forwards. I, I just think that's such a marvelous quote. I, when I was writing Land of Hope, I pinned it to my computer monitor to look at it uh, every day um, along with the title. Uh, which is the Land of Hope, which is the first thing I wrote about looking for. I wrote another word. Um, is we could just uh, spend the rest of our time unpacking uh, this passage's quote, but I, I want to emphasize the second paragraph um, the quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, sense of continuity with the past, uh, the idiot delusion of the exceptional now that we live in a time, and this is a something that we did not need the coronavirus to be subject to, this uh, idiot delusion. We live it all the time. Um, and uh, this idiot delusion, and by the way, he doesn't mean, he means the word idiot in an older sort of Greek sense of the word as being sort of uh, in a bubble. Uh, uh, this delusion that we live in an exceptional moment, that nothing like the time we live in has ever been, that nothing that has happened, no records of the past, no accounts of other human beings living in other times with, who did not have iPhones in their pockets, uh, could possibly capture the utterly distinctive and uh, unprecedented nature of now. Um, well, actually, one of the interesting things about the human condition is this propensity to think of the now as exceptional has existed for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe not always. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a feature of modernity. That's something to be interesting to talk about and unpack. But it certainly has, has been persistent in American history, in, my, in most of modernity, uh, this notion that that the past doesn't really hold um, any, any truths for us that are enduring in character, that we, we, are pro we, we are progressive, not necessarily capital P progressive, but we are, we are uh, always moving forward. Uh, we're people of the enlightenment. We're not bound anymore by the tutelage of the past. The past is past. Ride your carriage over the bones of the dead, as uh, Jefferson said. Um, and William Blake also. Uh, that's, that's a really, the, the earth belongs to the living. That's a Jefferson saying. You know, that, that's, uh, that's our propensity to see things in that way. So um, history, the study of history, you know, I've spent my life pushing the rock up that particular hill uh, only to watch it fall back down because it goes against our American grain in a lot of ways, and in some ways uh, that are that, that reflect something very good about America. That is our willingness to kind of pick ourselves up after our failures, maybe not always acknowledge them as failures, but pick ourselves up and, and push on. That kind of optimism, that sense of the future is always hopeful. So anyway, that, that, that can, I think, propel me now into talking about a little bit about the book. Um, and why did I write a, a textbook? Because that's what Land of Hope really is. It's, it's, I, I'm happy to say that a lot of people like it uh, simply as reading material. And uh, I, I wrote it for people like that. So I'm naturally gratified to have that kind of response. I certainly, even when Pete introduced me and said that this was a best-selling book. I, you know, I, every time I hear that, I, I have to pinch myself because I didn't expect it to, to be that. But it's that's a fair description of its reception, and uh, which is a, obviously personally gratifying, but it's also gratifying in a larger way. Because let me explain to you what I had in mind, what I hoped to accomplish with the book, and we'll see if it if it does that. Uh, I, I wanted to write a book, partly because I felt, and without criticizing anybody by name, but the existing textbooks were inadequate. They're either overly crammed with factoids 
with jazzy graphics and pictures, captions, sidebars, um, all kinds of whiz-bang effects, including now digital uh, addenda. And in fact, in the very near future, digital will be all there is in terms of textbook. I, I think it's fair to predict, at least coming from the big textbook publishers. Um, it's either that or it's something ideologically tendentious uh, American history is a parade of horrors. Everyone always cites Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States uh, as an example of that, a book that uh, um, we could spend a lot of time talking about its faults, but the, the main fault, I think, is that it is a very poor um, uh, substitute for the kind of, of text, the kind of fundamental grounding in American history that we need not just as educated people, but as citizens. Um, so what I tried to do is to write an account of American history that would be useful to the formation of Americans, of particularly young Americans, as citizens. Um, uh, I could go into some of the background. I, I, I uh, initially got the idea when the College Board, which is the organization that that administers advanced placement testing, including uh, European history and American history, um, changed their standards back in 2014 and uh, uh, moved towards a, a more, um, uh, uh, well, I would say uh, uh, ideologically slanted account of the American past, more by omission than commission, by the things that were left out, such as the, the dis discussion of the Constitution, of the, the formation of the Constitution, the political process, the, the great figures, James Madison, George Washington uh, is a name that disappears from the foundational documents in this revision. And this was alarming to me and a lot of others. And it planted in my mind the thought that, well, you know, even very good teachers, and I do a summer institute with teachers every year, wonderful teachers, they don't have the materials to work with. A lot of them have, end up having to use Zen because there's nothing else. And Zen does have the virtue of being uh, an interesting read. I mean, if you like comic books, you'll love Zen. But, but seriously, he actually writes pretty well. And uh, it, it's, it's an account of the past that holds your interest. Um, so uh, I felt I had to do that. I had to, be, to give a winsome text that would accomplish a lot of very particular ends to help shape students' sense of the land that they inhabit, equip them for citizenship and all of its privileges and responsibilities, and, and give them a sense of membership in this enterprise of American history. This is something, it's not just a subject matter, it's part of who they are, if, if, if assuming they are American citizens. I think my own profession, the historical profession, has not done a particularly good job of um, even thinking about these matters. In fact, I think most of my colleagues, if you ask them, at the American Historical Association meeting, let's say, uh, what sort of role ought they to have in the formation of American citizens through their teaching and scholarship? They would say none. Uh, and that's a, that's a sort of proud declaration of their professionalism, of their commitment to autonomous professional standards, not bowing the knee to the needs of the nation state or, or, or whatever. Um, I, I think there's something to be said for that outlook. Um, but I think there's also a great deal to be said against it if it's the exclusive outlook on the past. And we have to take responsibility for the fact that our young people now are growing up with a fractured, fragmented view of the American past at best. And they've lost a sense of the larger arc of that history of the ways in which uh, American history has a public meaning, uh, a meaning in the hearts and minds, if you will, of its, of its citizens. And we, we can have very unsophisticated versions of that, uh, 
um, in, 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 in which uh, we, we give little attention to the nuances of that history. Um, or we can strive to do better. And that's what I've, what I've uh, striven to do. I don't present American history as a fairy tale. I don't present it as, as a, a whitewash. I don't present it as a flawless uh, enterprise. I present it as a deeply flawed enterprise, which has in a great deal, although not all cases, been able to struggle to overcome its birth defects, shall we say. Um, uh, and um, and it, it continues to be, as I call it in the title of the book, a land of hope. Let me, let me, uh, I'm concerned about running out of time here. And let me just, uh, there's something I wanted to share with you. It, it's, um, um, ah, here it is. Um, it's a story about Abraham Lincoln. Of course, when we talk about American patriotism, uh, it's not long before Lincoln's name comes up, an American sense of national identity. Lincoln's great speeches, Gettysburg Address, first and second inaugurals, many others, uh, all the classic text in the formation of American national identity. Uh, I wanted to share something curious about him, uh, that he, he gave a, a, a speech um, in which he, he, uh, he was speaking to the legislature of New Jersey uh, not long after his election. He was the president-elect at this time. Um, and uh, he, he, he uh, gave a speech in which he acknowledged the fact that when he was a boy, and we all know Lincoln was a voracious reader of the, what little he could get his hands on. He was mostly self-educated and almost entirely self-educated. And, and that uh, it's generally said that his reading material was Shakespeare and the, and the King James Bible, which you can't go wrong with those two things. But the only historical work that we know of that he read as a boy was uh, Parson Weems' book about George Washington, which is the, uh, the, the, a book for which the term filiopietistic <laughs> could have been invented. That is, it was this adoring uh, mythic account of Washington, uh, including the story of the hatchet and the cherry tree um, that uh, was passed down for, for generations and, 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 uh, and uh, has repeatedly and decisively been debunked. Uh, I think it, it's actually hard for an adult person to believe it when they read it. But um, Lincoln said this was, this was the, the, the work of history that really formed him uh, in some ways as a young man. Let me read you um, part of this speech to the New Jersey legislature. It's in 1860. I mean, he's about to take the helm of a nation that's coming apart at the seams, you know, uh, much of the South has seceded by now. Um, in Virginia soon would, and that would carry carry the rest, and and uh, um, the rest of those who did secede. Um, uh, he said this. I remember. He, he, well, first I should say by way of preparation, he the speech is in Trenton, Trenton, New Jersey, which is not far from the spot where George Washington's troops won a great victory the day after Christmas, 1776. And this arguably saved the American Revolution, this great victory trend. So um, Lincoln says this to the legislators. I remember all the accounts in Weems's book of the battlefields and the struggles for the liberty of the country, and none fixed themselves upon my imagination so deeply as the struggle here at Trenton. The crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at that time, all fixed themselves on my memory more than any single revolutionary event. I recall then thinking, boy that I was, that there must have been something more than common that those men struggled for. So here he is speaking to the New, New Jersey legislature. This, time of unprecedented peril for the nation and unprecedented challenge for him as the incoming president. Um, a president for the first time in American history had been elected on a strictly sectional 
basis, not a single electoral vote from the South. So he said, he shifted his discourse and said this, I'm exceedingly anxious that what those men fought for, those men at Trenton, it's something even more than national independence, something that held out a great promise to all the people of the world for all time to come. I'm exceedingly anxious that this union, the constitution and the liberties of the people shall be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. So uh, cutting through all of this, can we say that that story of Parson Lee's about George Washington, the cherry tree, about George Washington's incorruptible character, uh, had a role in helping Lincoln to think through his own ideas of statesmanship and of what a great American statesman uh, held as his chief responsibility. I think we can. I think we can, I think we can conclude that this story, and call it a myth, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly content with that, um, it has a mythic power, power to shape character in a way that will endure even when circumstances seem to be pitted against him. Um, that's, we don't, I'm not saying we need to write history that way, that we should go back to, to George Washington and cherry trees and, uh, um, you know, the, stories about Pocahontas and so on that, that are part of the sort of uh, mythic uh, folklore of the country, things that we generally like to laugh at, and, and, uh, or if not scorn. But on the other hand, if history is so devoid of practical examples of people uh, who provide an ex aspirational example of something that, uh, that, 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 that provides a star to which we can, can um, fasten ourselves. <laughs> uh, uh, what was it Emerson said, you know, uh, uh, fasten your wagon to a star. Uh, if we don't have that aspirational element anymore arising out of our history, what do we have? Um, and I'll, I'll conclude. I think I'm probably running out of time here. <laughs> we have <laughs> but, about eight minutes. For okay. Yeah, well, this is, I, 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 I want to conclude with something. This is a little bit um, uh, speculative, um, but we're allowed to do this. And, um, and it was aroused in my mind by uh, an article I saw uh, by uh, the columnist Dennis Prager in, in which which is titled, Why Are So Many Young People Unhappy? Um, and it, it's a pretty interesting, interesting article. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and he talks about a lot of different issues. But he ends up saying this, the bottom line at the very end of the article, the bottom line, the reason so many young people are depressed, unhappy, and angry is that the left has told them that God and Judeo-Christian religions are nonsense, their country is largely evil, their past is deplorable, and their future is hopeless. Hmm. Well, let's leave out the ideological dimension. I mean, it's not only the left that does this, and there are parts of the left that don't do it. So, so uh, I, I don't agree with him completely, but um, I think the gist of it is pretty powerful, that if you're a young person growing up in an environment in which Howard Zinn is what passes for a truthful account of the American past. What is there to admire? What the, is there to want to attach yourself to? What is there to hope for from that? And uh, it's, it's not surprising that we are suffering through a period, and this is where I get highly speculative, but in which life expectancy from, for Americans has gone down in recent years, that we have these, what they're called diseases of despair, that uh, often it, it are tied to opioids and, and uh, the spread of various kinds of self-destructive behavior, suicide, and so on. 
And can we really, do we really have to conclude that these are only due to material or economic causes? Hmm. Uh, is there an absence of hope and an absence of hope that springs from the loss of a sense that our collective enterprise, this enterprise that we're, we've undertaken together as a people, as self-ruling, self-governing people, democratic people, that this is no longer um, an enterprise worthy of our support, worthy of our love. Um, I'll just, as, as one final comment, uh, the, the nicest compliment anyone has paid to my book, and since unfortunately he's died recently, nobody can, um, <laughs> he can't take it back, <laughs> uh, was the philosopher Roger Scruton. Roger Scruton said in his very elliptical and British way, this is the history of the United States, see if I can get this right, it's the history of the United States to which one can imagine that young Americans finally will feel themselves willing to, to which young Americans will find themselves willing to attach themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. Not necessarily attach themselves in an uncritical way. You can attach yourself in a way of saying, this is my country, damn it. And I'm not happy with this aspects of it. That's fine. But civics and history need to be conjoined. They've been separated. Uh, our notion of, of, of engagement, of civic engagement, which is one of the things we try to do here at the School of Public Policy, is to, is to foster uh, informed engagement. Well, informed engagement means a knowledge of that past, and a knowledge of that past not only as a bank of answers to questions that might present them. Sometimes the past doesn't give us any answers. Sometimes it doesn't give us directions. Uh, or a key uh, to the future. Uh, sometimes historical consciousness is all we get from the past, but historical consciousness is a precious thing because it is historical consciousness, that, that sense of the imminence of the past and the present that makes us feel connected to that past, to those who came before us, and that we are part of that enterprise and that will be carried forward into the future. Well, next time, I know we're going to pause for questions here, but I, what, what I wanted to say is for the next three lectures, I want to talk about specific uh, periods in the American past that shed light on these themes, mm -hmm. taken from the book, of course, which in case you missed, <laughs> missed it, it's <laughs> available on Amazon. Available, available everywhere. Operators stand everywhere, by. <laughs> everywhere great books are sold. <laughs> and cheap. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bill, so much for that. I see some questions beginning to uh, come in. And I wonder if I could start with the sure. moderator's prerogative and ask you the first question, because I think it is really one of the provocative things that you've said here in this first session, which is I, I've thought for some time that this current pandemic that we're wrestling with is a stress test across all of our institutions, our governments mm -hmm. at all levels our civic institutions, our individual ability to, to self-govern. Um, but one of the provocative things I think you've, you've made the case here is that it's also a stress test on our relationship to our communities and our country. And that connection that you gave in that Lincoln quote, that at a time of great peril, he looks back to a preceding time of great peril as being a way of inspiring uh, us in the current moment and the importance of understanding that history. I'm not seeing in a lot of the commentary, whether it's in media or opinion pieces or whatever, a, a discussion of, of where we're at in, in historical terms. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit. Oh, you know, I, think I, I think there's been a real failure and I think there's a predisposition. You know, David Brooks, um, no less. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no more, no less. Uh, David Brooks wrote a, a column very early on in this and said, this, it, which he said, this is going to be really bad. And uh, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, uh, but this is going to be really bad. Things like this bring out the worst in people. We're very divided. You just wait and see how bad it's going to get. Yeah. Well, 
sorry. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, his, his, uh, I think his expectations have not been met. And of course, it's always safe, just as it's safe to predict 100 billion deaths. Uh, and when you come in under that, nobody's going to say, you said, uh, you know, uh, we, we, everyone's delighted and relieved when things are not that bad. But I think that, that Brooks and others have missed um, uh, the degree of pulling together and selflessness and uh, genuine concern that uh, for for others that we see all around us. You know, part of the problem is that we're we're being told. You know, after nine eleven, we were told by George Bush to go shopping. Now we're being told to stay home. Uh, it, it's it's um, that's not hard to do for some of us anyway. I mean, I I can imagine for some people it's, it's death and warmed over to stay home. But um, it doesn't seem very heroic. Um, and there is something in us, I think there's a real need, especially I see this among young people, that they, they, they would love, they don't know it, but they would love to have a heroic cause for their generation and not have to um, sort of ride in the caboose of other generations' claims, as my generation ran in the caboose of the greatest generation. So that uh, they want to have great causes of their own. This is this doesn't quite provide that um, in obvious ways, but in small ways, uh, I think you're seeing. I, I'm very proud of my country right now. I'm I'm proud of what I see people doing, and I see it in very small ways. I am. Uh, Nobody's going to feel sorry for me for this, but I'm confined to the Pepperdine campus uh, for the duration, which is, as you know, one of the ugliest places on earth. And uh, uh, but I I see every day uh, people in this little bitty community, uh, and many of us hardly knew one another uh, when we were about our daily business of going hither and yon and and uh, um, and taking care of children and and all of that. Well, now we. We're getting to know one another and doing favors for one another. The, the, uh, um, I won't go into details and embarrass people, but uh, it, it is, uh, it's gratifying and it makes you realize that uh, out of adversity, even unheroic adversity, uh, community arises. So I, I think it, stress test, yes, but it's also a kind of the kind of stress that builds muscles, mm -hmm. you know, that, that are, have atrophied. Um, uh, so I, I uh, incidentally, if I could say one thing about, and I just keep thinking about the fact there are actually people around the world watching this. He, he probably means there are a few people in Canada, but, um, but I'm, gonna, I'm thinking people in Singapore and uh, Australia and so on. Um, one of the predictions that's been made all over the place, particularly on the right side of, of the spectrum, is that globalism is over. Coronavirus, it's in, ended. Uh, well, you know, look, I think there's some validity to this, some plausibility to it that, that we're going to think um, much more carefully about um, <laughs> certainly supply chains for pharmaceuticals and, uh, and not having everything uh, come from China. I think our relationship with China is in the process of being restructured and already was. But there's something, this notion that we're, that we're now all going to sort of disaggregate into our national communities and uh, we have a more 19th century world. That's, that's crazy because uh, it seems to me just as possible that this incident uh, in which everybody around the world, people in Britain, people in Germany, people in Turkey, people in Russia, people in China, people in South America and Africa increasingly, are all experiencing this pandemic, that this is a kind of international global bond of shared experience that we don't know yet. It may prove to be a passing thing, uh, but it may, uh, may be transformative. It may actually increase global sensibility rather than decrease. And we just don't know. But there are historical examples. I'll give you an example from American history. It may seem a little far-fetched, but I don't think it is at all. In the 18th century, uh, the British North American colonies all thought of themselves as British colonies. And, and that, that, that uh, 
uh, one's great pride was in, in having British English, the rights of Englishmen, British citizenship. Uh, the notion of America, of an American sensibility, American culture, uh, uniting these colonies was very, very tenuous at best. Um, well, several things come along to change that, and one of which, of course, is war, French and Indian War. But even before that, the Great Awakening, which was a, a, a period of evangelical religious revival, up and down the, the seaboard, out into the frontier, um, which caused enormous agitation and division in the churches, uh, uh, the established churches of all the colonies. You know, uh, uh, and they, these played out in terms of class uh, divisions and, and, uh, and so on. But um, the Great Awakening was an event shared by all the colonists. And it actually, I think historians have very plausibly made the case that it was one of the first events that helped to galvanize a sense of Americanness, of it, that there was something that all Americans had in common. Um, now, again, it's a, it's a somewhat different uh, matter, and it's, it, it's uh, but, but I think there's a way in which this shared experience, uh, particularly, we don't know how it's all going to play out mm -hmm. at this point. Um, it's very likely to play, well, I won't, I'm not even going to speculate. Uh, we don't know how it's going to play out, but I think it, it could well play out in a way very different from what all the smug uh, know-it-all uh, predictors are saying. So uh, we, we should be very cautious about that. And I think we should be spending our time trying to solve the problem that's before us instead of speculating, well, what is this going to do to dating? What is this going to do to, you know, uh, uh, relationships and families, and, and you know, that's all interesting stuff, but uh, let's, let's concentrate on the present. Another question, Bill, has uh, come in, and again, just a reminder for those of you who may have joined this session a few minutes in, uh, we're inviting questions through the chat feature on Zoom, which you'll see at the bottom portion of your screen. If you simply click on the chat button, you'll see a uh, a text screen come up and you're able to type your questions here, which we're, uh, I'm passing along here as the moderator. Bill, before this, as it relates to the, the study and consideration of history, uh, we have gone through this period of uh, tearing down of Civil War statues. Uh, we have the 1619 Project uh, out of the New York Times, which sets the founding of America really at the beginning of the of the slave trade. Uh, to your point about one of the reasons of writing this book is that there seemed to be an imbalanced understanding of history, that it was in some ways founded in original sin, really. I mean, if you look at the 1619 mm -hmm. Project, that very much is part of the argument they're making. We're, we're not having those conversations <laughs> right now. Uh, and, and I wonder if in some ways one of the the casualties of the coronavirus may be this, this, what seemed to be with increasing speed and discussion, this jaundiced negative view of, of American history that, that frankly does not prepare citizens for a time of great calamity. Um, so I wondered if you could speak a little bit to to those efforts, which again, we're not seeing a lot, a lot of. Yeah, them. yeah, uh, that, that's, that's really interesting. I think, um, and of course I'm chomping at the bit to talk about the 1619 Project, but, I'll, but I, think, I think you're right that it, it, it doesn't seem so urgent anymore. Uh, that's certainly the case. And um, uh, the sort of fruitlessness of that kind of enterprise seems apparent. There is a way in which, um, you know, that's it. this Dr. Johnson's The Prospect of Hanging concentrates the mind. Uh, the, the prospect of uh, a, uh, a global pandemic that could, you know, wipe out much of the population concentrates the mind uh, um, and uh, makes, makes one put away, you know, I won't say childish things, but things that, that um, 
that are past their sell-by date in terms mm. of our, our, cons our, our national concerns. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, history is, is an enormously valuable resource but it can be misused in ways that become the sort of playground for experts, for ideologues, for people who want to create a usable past for their own sort of perspective on how it all should be reformed, who want to elevate this, the sense of their own time by denigrating um, the great figures of the past. Um, which is different from saying that we should um, look at them in an, un, you know, an unvarnished way. We shouldn't, we, 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 we can't uh, relegate historical study to, to mythology. But we also need to learn, we need to have a mature attitude towards our past that, that recognizes the humanity mm -hmm. of the founders, for example. And, uh, but, but gives, them credit for the ways in which they uh, they both transcended, transcended that all too human quality of humanity. Well, I guess part of it too, Bill, is, and it's something that you've said here a couple different times, that if we don't get this question right, and by that I mean how we're teaching this in our schools, we are we are not preparing citizens that are able to withstand the kind of crisis that demands the collaboration and and sense of identity i think one of the things that's been so remarkable about these past few weeks is to hear state by state governors celebrate the identity of being a citizen of that state yes right we see it here yes. in california yes. where governor yes. newsom says yes. this is what californians do whether you're in kansas or ohio yeah. or yeah. wherever so the, the question of identity which i think in many cases on the left has been dismissed as you know we think of ourselves as global citizens or as radical individuals that the or as members of a particular ethnic ethnic or racial group or with or sexual politics identity. right yeah right but this, this importance about identity and, and finding uh, affiliation, which again is to go back to the Scruton quote about your book, yeah. um, is, is important to find uniquely in history and civics education. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it, it, it's, civic education has to involve love. It has hmm. to involve the process of, you and I have talked about this, it, it, in fact, I, I, most of what I think about this, I got so let's be honest about it. But civic education has to involve um, a reasoned attachment, the instilling of a reasoned attachment to one's own, to the, to the institutions and the history and land uh, to which one belongs. Uh, and uh, if you don't have that, you don't really have anything. Hmm. And a point I often make to people uh, on the left about this is that if you don't have, if you, if you spend um, all your time and energy trashing the very idea of the nation state, let alone the uniquely pernicious American nation state, how are you going to draw people together hmm. to say, well, we, 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 we ought to make common cause in uh, having national health insurance? How are you going to convince people to make the kind of sacrifices, the kind of contributions to the general good that are required of them, if you're gonna have anything like that uh, come to pass, if you don't have a strong sense of the nation, a strong sense of the nation as something for which um, your sacrifice um, is an ordinate and appropriate, fitting and proper <laughs> uh, um, gesture, uh, you, you, you can't do it. So uh, it, it's it's um, uh, it's really and, and we had a during the '90s there was a kind of flurry of uh, I think corresponding with the Clinton years there was a sort of flurry of recognition some on the left um, that yeah there has to be patriotism is not an optional thing if we're going to get through to the objectives that we have in mind we we have we can't be trashing the nation state at every mm. turn. But my, my point would be too, and this is why I hesitated to introduce the Parson Weems example, but is it also has to be truthful. You know, the truth of the matter about this nation 
is that it is one of the remarkable achievements of human history. That's the truth. Uh, if I didn't believe that it was the truth, I couldn't have written the book and, and sort of fobbed it off on everybody. I do believe it's the truth. And I do believe that the, the Howard Zinn version is not the truth. Um, I think it's a piece of the truth. I think part of the misfortune of Zinn's book is if it was just a bit of ancillary reading that we did in, in addition to reading a, a more stately, um, like uh, the um, Samuel A. Morris and Henry Cometer textbook uh, of old, um, that wouldn't be so bad. You know, have a little bit of uh, uh, kind of <laughs> criticism from the peanut gallery. Um, but when it becomes the leading textbook, when it sells almost 4 million copies, um, you're in trouble. <laughs> Well, on that note, Bill, I see that we're at time. I want to thank you all for joining us. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, this is just the first of four Friday uh, classes in this series, uh, but it's also the first of three different Friday classes that we're offering here today. I know that many of you have registered for uh, the class following this in one half hour. We're going to welcome Dr. Gordon Lloyd to take us into a conversation about the roots of Don't capitalism versus socialism. Great conversation. And then we conclude our Friday uh, short course series with Dr. Robert Kaufman uh, beginning at 1130 Pacific time with a discussion of Trump's foreign policy and the major themes in American foreign policy. So this is uh, where you tune in uh, for next week, or if you want to stay online for uh, our next session coming up in one half hour. I want to thank you all for joining us here live from Malibu, California, and Pepperdine School of Public Policy. We look forward to seeing you next time right here.